Hi, I'm Keshav Tadamedi from Cluster 4 uh, Cosmos UC Davis, and uh, I'm presenting on active computer security, but specifically active network security. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, the issue in today's world is that there's so many viruses that it's virtually impossible to defend against every single one. It, and we all probably know that by the end of this course. Um, but the things are, the, the problem is that we know it, but not everybody else outside there knows it. They, uh, if we depend on only antivirus systems, we're not going to be able to defend against threats because uh, there are threats being developed every day. And uh, to prove this, uh, I went to Symantec's website and looked up how many known viruses they had on July 27th, uh, 2000, uh, about a week ago. And there are 19,332,997 known viruses, or detected viruses. And uh, just two days ago, I checked and uh, we have, what, 19,423,378. So we've gone up another 100,000 in just one week. Or even more, or less, actually. But So this shows that there, it's hard to defend against all the viruses. I mean, this, these are all the known viruses. What about the all unknown viruses that we, we have yet to be attacked by? So uh, unless you go to Symantec's plan of updating every five minutes, which... Uh, <laughs> which is kind of inefficient because you're not going to, like uh, Mark Dossier said, you're not going to be attacked by a virus that was just created nine seconds ago. <laughs> it, 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 there has to be some level. It's like security versus efficiency. And uh, the problem is people don't want to subscribe for uh, expensive plans such as updating your virus system every five minutes because it, there's no point. And if they don't do that, though, they, they have a possibility of getting hacked by these 100,000 viruses that were just created last week. So, uh, th these are just some, some scary thoughts to think about that it's not a safe world out there on the internet. And uh, we're all safe until we realize we're connected to the internet, which is virtually everything. So, uh, obviously, depending just on antivirus systems can be hard, but they have to do their job correctly. Like, what they're supposed to do is defend against all known viruses. and. Um, once you've been attacked by a virus, let's say uh, a common virus, if you update your system, you won't be attacked by that virus again. And uh, it, it, it's reliable in the sense that you won't, it, that no, all known viruses, you can defend against them. But the problem is there are more unknown viruses than there are all known viruses. So you, you run the risk of being, uh, if you just depend on an antivirus system. So uh, instead of, if you just rely on an antivirus system, in my opinion, you're running a sedentary approach. You're waiting to be attacked uh, and defending. Antivirus systems, when you scan for a virus, to uh, a virus, you've already been infected. Your files have already been attacked. And um, for all you know, when your antivirus system says fix to all infected files, you have no way of knowing whether or not it's actually telling the truth, whether your antivirus system itself has not been infected. So there, you're waiting to be attacked, and that's not exactly being very actively secure. And Another thing is that antivirus systems require updates. If those updates are fake, and, you have, and you're downloading malware into your system, then you're, for all you know, you might be writing uh, a virus or malware to your hard drive, which is really hard to remove. So uh, that's why we've resorted to network, uh, active network defense, and IDS, intrusion detection systems, firewalls, because uh, large corporate, uh, corporate settings or corporate bus businesses, they can't depend just on antivirus systems. So uh, uh, going to network defense would be a lot more reliable. So uh, the par parts of a network defense system uh, involve uh, an IDS, uh, firewalls, uh, possibly an automated system, and the most important part, the user, which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Uh, for obvious reasons, because uh, you can have just a, a really safe system, but when you bring a user in, it becomes very volatile and dangerous. But uh, the, the reason we have network security systems is because we have to detect a virus before it comes onto your computer, or any malware signature. So uh, I looked into uh, active network defenses that were successful, and uh, when we went to Sandia National Labs, uh, we found, I found out about the Adaptive Network Countermeasures, which is uh, a system that uh, effectively and uh, effectively defends against uh, malware packages that might contain uh, viruses. And uh, but it's the thing is, it's automated. You can't have uh, people working 24/7 looking at 
uh, Wireshark or other IDEA systems to, uh, to see if certain packages are uh, malicious because some, you're, you're risking human error. That too, if you run an automated system, you run automated error, but we'll get to that later. So uh, the parts of this, this system, the aspects are that uh, it provides, according to the, the creators of the system, uh, it provides a comprehensive and robust countermeasure system. So it's, it has a system of checks and balances. And it also uh, dynamically responds to uh, threats. It adapts, essentially learns as the system is being run. Uh, and uh, it has uh, an extensible architecture for conducting the act uh, aftermentioned activities, which essentially means it allows all the uh, normal network processes to run uh, and at the same time as blocking all malicious activity. So the system has uh, two, essentially two parts. So it has a decision-making body called Athena, named after the Greek goddess of wisdom, and uh, has a, another system called uh, Honeybee-enabled network countermeasures, or HANK. So we'll talk about Athena first. So this, uh, as mentioned, is the decision-making system of the uh, of ANC, or Adaptive Network Countermeasures. And, uh, what it does is it analyzes packages that come in using uh, to, uh, a function called IP input, which analyzes what the input, the destination of the package, the file type, the size. And then uh, what it does, it, de depending on that, it, it analyzes a database, which looks at a score of IPs. So this, this database has um, IP addresses that have scores. These uh, scores are just numbers. So suppose, uh, William attempts to hack into my network, and uh, this is his first attempt. So it, the, the database records his IP, and then he starts at score zero. Suppose he attacks me, and then let's say uh, it was a failed attempt. Uh, he, let's say Athena adds five points to that database. The next time it accesses, next time William tries hacking in again, it'll look at that score and say, it's five. Okay, uh, well, we'll give him another shot, see if he's a good person. It'll still block out the malicious content because it sends it through a firewall, IPFW, which is the firewall method. But it'll keep accessing that database of IP scores. And eventually when it hits a limit of, in this case, it was 25, it'll start throwing them to countermeasures, which uh, brings us into Hank, which is essentially the honeypot. And uh, the user does not know that they're in a honeypot because this system, a honeybee enabled countermeasures, is automated. When Athena find, uh, looks back at the database and sees that the user is malicious, this IP address, this guy's been trying to hack into me five for the past, what, two days, then it'll t um, send them to countermeasures, which will give you a fake desktop uh, based on this program called Template Builder, which builds a, fa a fake desktop, fake OS system, make it look uh, legitimate, and then make the malicious user think they are hacking into the system when instead they are just left resting in a honeypot. And possibly the, the user, if you alter the ANC system, you could alert the user that somebody's hacking into your computer and uh, in that case, the, the user rests in the, or the malicious person rests in the user's mercy. And uh, the pros and cons of the system are that uh, ANC is compatible with lots of, uh, lots of OS systems. Newer updates come, it can still work with it, and uh, there won't be any uh, confusion or confliction. And uh, also, it, it learns, as I said, actively adapts to the network, and uh, it responds really fast. It, if you have a fast system, if they ran it on a 512 megabyte, uh, with a system with 512 megabyte RAM, and now that we have 16 gigabyte RAM, 32 gigabyte, this will be running really fast. Um, the cons, however, are that uh, if the, the hackers might see through that this is a honeypot, if possible, if they look through their network passages, uh, packages and the messages sent. And then um, also the system requires to look at the database. If that database is wiped clean, then the malicious user is let inside. And then uh, finally, uh, there, uh, the, it also requires a lot of system processes. This, if, if your computer does not have enough, if you're running an older system, and you don't have enough computing power, then your system, then this work system won't work. Uh, another uh, network system I looked at was the di distribution detection method, which essentially looks at a, a multi-nesh network, which essentially 
a multi-node network, which actually looks at a network made up of a bunch of nodes. And uh, as Nick had mentioned, these node, the, the network hops from nodes to the destination. So if, let's say, a node breaks down, there's multiple ways to get to your destination. Your, your, your network won't crash. So this, this method involves using uh, an IDS for each individual node. And then uh, what it has is right here. Um, so when a package comes in, it, um, this IDS system has been broken up into two layers. So when the package comes in, it's first analyzed by a thing called the event engine, which uh, just just writes or analyzes which um, it, it just records what's happened, and then it, it's analyzed by the distribution de uh, intrusion detection mechanism, which makes uh, a uh, actually a report based on these are the number of malicious attempts or this is possibly a malicious package uh, called this thing called misbehaving metrics, and then uh, finally. Uh, all the nodes bring all their misbehaving metrics together. They look at there's a statistical analysis, and then a thing called the cooperative consensus mechanism uh, essentially takes out all outliers of the system, and then uh, just just makes an accurate report saying that this IP might be uh, infected or whatnot. So this this method is really efficient because it's accurate, and there's not that much memory required. Um, because each individual node needs memory, but there's not a massive idea scanning all the nodes. Mm -hmm. And then the cons are that there's an overhead that uh, you might have a higher, possibly electricity bill, or there might be more network activity, it might be slower because it's going through uh, these many checks and balances. And then uh, there, if the communication link between each node is infected or somehow destroyed, then uh, you might have a, a problem with it. Uh, so a solution, uh, a uh, the proposition I had was if you combine these two methods or two idea uh, systems to make one that uh, essentially had Athena uh, combined with the cooperative consensus mechanism, you could have a system that has a system of checks and balances where it it uh, would look at the detection results and also Athena's database score. So. Uh, Essentially, there'd be uh, Athena if Athena finds out that a malicious IP uh, and the uh, the detection result says that no, it isn't. Then you could use a third-party sandbox or a virtual machine to test your packages, analyze if they're uh, malicious or not. And uh, it's, it's just mainly uh, since I'm running out of time. But essentially, if uh, if you combine the two systems and made a system that had a uh, these two systems checking each other, making sure that if one of the systems were infected or altered by a malicious user, then the other system would watch over it and make sure that nothing's going on, that, that there's actually malicious users are being blocked. And uh, well, the, essentially, the, uh, the system would, if, if Athena uh, were to say that a malicious I, there's a malicious IP uh, and the distributed detection method says that there isn't, then uh, then it would still block the IP because uh, Athena's database or score would uh, it probably more accurate because it's weighted in this it might be weighted higher because it, it keeps records of uh, the malware activity. Uh, if you flip it around and Athena says that there isn't, but the distributed detection method says that there is a malicious IP, then it'd be sent to the uh, sandbox. Uh, which is efficient because you don't have to use this third party every time, which will slow down your network. And then finally, you could have both systems supporting each other to either allow something in or to kick the, the guy into the honeypot. And uh, essentially, uh, we can't depend all on antivirus systems just to uh, defend our computers. Uh, sooner or later, you're going to get hacked. Like Professor Peisert says, it's not a question of whether you'll get hacked. It's a question of when you will. And you, you have to be prepared for this. If you sit uh, at home with just an antivirus system, uh, sooner or later, you're, you're, you're going to get wiped clean. And uh, you'll, you're, you'll feel the need to actively secure your computer. So whether it be during, through firewalls or IDS systems or any of these, uh, or implementing any of these systems, uh, sooner or later, we're all going to have to move to network defense. Okay, uh oh, sure.
Oh, um, if you have both systems working at once, wouldn't that like use a lot of computing power? Yeah, that was one of the things is that the positive thing is that it's accurate. There's the level of false positives and false negatives are lowered. But yeah, it takes a lot of computing power. You might have network traffic and slowing down the user might get a little bit angry, but it's it's sacrificing efficiency for security. So, Kishan, you mentioned the idea of uh, the fake desktop. What m what might it do? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they had a, a a function called Template Builder, which randomly built templates okay. or desktops, like a regular Linux desktop right. or right. Windows desktop, and then it would just wait there like a honeypot. It just waits there to be hacked. The user could analyze it, and these these countermeasures, whether it be that the the hacker himself gets denial of service or whether he, he gets restricted access when he's inside. He right. tries to become root user, but then the computer locks him out. Right. It could be like that, and it, there's randomly generated countermeasures by the system. I see, and, and supposedly legitimate users wouldn't get thrown to the fake desktop, I guess, right? No, because uh, if the, the scores, Athena's database scores, I if see. it shows that it's a legitimate user, it'll let them pass okay. it. So how does it calculate which score to give the each attempt. Well, if there's you, a you most, yeah. Well, it, it just keeps adding numbers. Every time you reboot the system, it looks at the score, and every time something bad happens, it adds one more to the score or adds two to the score. Oh, that's <laughs>